Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay? Just a quick mic check. Okay, awesome. So I'm really, really excited and extremely honored to be here uh, talking with you all today. Um, I am based in San Francisco, so it was definitely a journey uh, to get here uh, to Lisbon, but I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. So a little bit of, of who I am and, and why I'm actually here talking with you today. How many of you know what you want to be when you grow up? I thought I did. For most of my life, I wanted to be a shark scientist. I went to college to be a marine biologist, and I had my mindset that this is what I was going to do. Halfway through my program, I realized that I didn't want to do any of the jobs um, that marine biologists have. I just wanted to, to scuba dive with, with sharks for fun. Uh, and so I turned it into a hobby, and that's something that I still have in my life, but I decided it wasn't something I wanted to do for a career. And so I ended up finishing my degree in communications. And I started working for um, a PR agency working on corporate sustainability projects. Um, so my master's degree and, and research is really focused in how communications professionals can help companies be better environmental citizens uh, and, ha and reduce their footprint um, on the environment. And I did that for a few years and decided you know, I, I just I wanted something bigger, something that uh, would give me even more international and global experience. Um, and one of the first projects that came across my desk was worth, working with the chief security office at AT&T, uh, which is a big telco um, in the US. And so I worked with that team for about six years. And that's really where I cut my teeth uh, in cybersecurity. Uh, and so I went from working with sharks and protecting sharks and doing a lot of conservation work uh, for marine science to working with companies and helping them understand their environmental footprint and then ultimately going into cybersecurity where our focus is really on protecting people um, and, and their information. And so I share this with you simply so that you can see how off course um, things really go and it's okay if you don't know what you want to do right now. Uh, and so I would encourage you to just be really open uh, to different types of experiences and opportunities that come your way. Uh, so it turns out that there's actually a lot of things that I learned uh, in marine biology and working with sharks that translated very well to working with corporate sustainability um, projects to then also working uh, in cybersecurity and with hackers in particular. So outside of uh, the job that I have now at Uber, um, I'm also on the organizing uh, committee for DEF CON, uh, which is the world's largest hacker conference. Uh, it happens every summer in Las Vegas. Last year, we had about 25,000 people uh, attend this conference. Uh, and we have all different types of hacking villages, from car hacking to lock picking. Uh, last year, we actually hacked a lot of the election systems. Um, that are used uh, in the United States, which has actually resulted in some really cool uh, reform and better security uh, for the technologies that, that we use in elections. I also help run a nonprofit called Women in Security and Privacy, uh, which is really focused on helping women uh, move into leadership roles uh, within the industries of security and privacy. This is particularly important not just because diversity is a very real issue that we have in our industry, but because the world of security and privacy used to be separate within companies. And it used to, these used to be siloed um, disciplines. And they're now converging. And so if you want to be a chief privacy officer, or if you want to be a chief security officer, or have leadership roles uh, in those organizations, you need to have some expertise of both. Uh, and so WISP, as we call it, uh, is really focused on helping women cross-train uh, so that they can uh, develop mastery in both of those skills so that they can assume those leadership roles. Which essentially means that I spend lots and lots of time with hackers uh, and with uh, security professionals all over the world, uh, which led me to this career in security communications. Now, security communications can mean different things at different companies. Um, this is a little bit of a summary of what it means at Uber. Um, I do some internal um, efforts as well as external. So internally, I'm involved in a lot of the planning and strategy of our security organization, particularly 
as it relates to the security and privacy features that we're building into our products for consumers. So helping them understand what's gonna be the most impactful, what's gonna help people feel really safe, um, and helping the product teams think about the external uh, stakeholders and environments that they're working in. Um, Cross-functional mediation is also uh, a big part of my job inside our teams. A lot of people uh, may not be aware of the fact that security teams inside companies don't actually own any of the systems or the infrastructure uh, that we're responsible for protecting. And so the relationship that you have with your other technical and engineering teams is really important in making sure that things get patched, things get fixed uh, in a timely manner. Uh, and so I do a lot of uh, communication and mediation work uh, across technical teams to make sure that we have shared goals, uh, that we're getting the types of resources um, prioritized uh, for those security projects. Uh, and employee relations is really important in security. Uh, one of the things that the industry has uh, recently um, started discussing, and which I'm really happy to see, uh, is the issue with burnout and team morale. Uh, security is a very, very intense, yet very rewarding profession. Uh, and if you don't pay attention to your employees and your team members and their experiences, uh, it you know, can feel a little bit like you're constantly putting out fires. Um, and so understanding the, the culture um, of your teams is really important. I also do a lot of advocacy work. So even within our um, different business units in the company, it's my job to go to the meeting and to advocate for better security, to advocate for better privacy. Um, again, to think about what are the needs of the business and how do we balance that with giving our customers good privacy and good security. Uh, and that ties into a lot of the product development stuff as well. So uh, a lot of companies, particularly tech companies, when they're building a new product, uh, will issue what's called an RFC or a request for comments. Uh, I get added to that distribution to make sure that we're looking at how we're building systems and products through the perspective of our users uh, and making sure that security and privacy um, are top of mind and prioritized considerations. And I do that alongside our um, security and privacy engineers um, so they can uh, help us make sure that we're getting all the right technical components. Externally, my role uh, deals a lot with journalists uh, what you might consider to be traditional media relations, helping to explain to people outside the company what we're actually doing in regards to security and privacy. There's a lot of community engagement involved. It's one of the reasons why I'm here uh, speaking with all of you now, is so that we can understand what's happening in the community, what the new trends are, what the concerns are, uh, and building relationships. If you go into a career in security, it's really important that you have relationships with other security teams at other companies. There's a lot of information sharing, a lot of collaboration, and a lot of exchange that happens because at the end of the day, we're all, really, we're all fighting the exact same challenges um, and very similar threats. I work a lot with our bug bounty team as well. Uh, there'll be more of that coming up. Uh, but Bug Bounty uh, is essentially a program where outside researchers will find um, security vulnerabilities in our products, uh, report them to us, and we will uh, reward them with um, a cash bounty. Uh, and that involves a lot of communication between my internal engineers and outside researchers. So you can understand, particularly when this is all happening asynchronously uh, online, that sometimes there's, you know, there's a high likelihood for miscommunication um, or misunderstanding, and so I'll get involved in some of those uh, mediation efforts as well. Um, and then the, the last two things that I'll just mention briefly are content development and consumer education, making sure um, that the people who are using our products are getting the information that they need to understand um, when they have a choice, how to use the controls that we give them to improve their security and privacy, uh, one of the things that I've learned in my career is it's not enough to just give them that control if you don't teach them how to use it. Uh, and so uh, a, a lot of that falls um, under my realm as well. So today specifically I want to talk to you about fear. Right? Uh, normally we think of fear as an emotional experience, um, but fundamentally it's actually a series of neurological um, reactions. And so, I, I'm gonna ask a question, I know no one's gonna raise your hand, but we'll just see what happens. Does anybody know what part of the brain this is that the arrow is pointing to? I'm sorry? It's the limbic system. So this is the part of your brain that's actually responsible uh, 
uh, for when you're stressed or when you experience fear, this is the part of your brain that gets triggered, right? Uh, and so you have your, you actually have two amygdala um, on both sides um, of your brain behind um, the optic nerve. That's responsible for your emergency response or what we would consider to be fight or flight. Um, also uh, within the limbic system is the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and focus. Uh, and then the hypothalamus, which actually regulates your hormones and is responsible for what we call homeostasis. And in fact, I think we're probably most familiar with the physiological effects of fear. So your amygdala releases chemicals. One of the things to keep in mind about fear is that it actually wreaks havoc on our brains, right? Fear is actually a really bad thing when it, if we're trying to make good decisions uh, and if we're trying to improve our memory and information retention. So when your amygdala is triggered, it releases all of these chemicals. And stress hormones now, they're, they're flooding our system, right? So you might um, see increased heart rate, or your palms get sweaty, um, or your voice starts to quiver. These are um, parts of your body that are getting ready for fight or flight, right? It's sending hormones and adrenaline throughout your body so that your muscles are ready to run away if you need to. Uh, and then you'll have shallow, rapid breathing to get more oxygen. Uh, into your bloodstream, again, to help your muscles um, to get ready for that flight response. So one of the things that I want to note here um, is that from a neuroscience perspective, when we talk about um, when we talk about the, the emotion of fear, it really is this overwhelming um, dysfunction uh, in the cognitive parts of the brain. Um, and so, if you thinking about uh, what actually happens when our brain is exposed to a stimuli uh, in the limbic system over and over again, um, I, I want to come back to this in a couple of minutes, but I want you to think about um, what could happen. Um, so when this happens and when your, uh, your limbic system is stimulated, the actual cognitive effects of this is that the neural pathways between your prefrontal cortex actually shuts down. This is a big problem because this is the part of your brain that actually helps you make decisions. This is where your judgment lives. And when you're experiencing fear, those connections um, are inhibited. So if we're thinking about, I'm trying to teach somebody something about security, or I'm trying to help them understand the right decision to help them be safer online or with their um, personal information, shutting down those pathways is you know, kind of counterproductive, right? Uh, your complex decision making disappears. One of the things that we talk a lot about in security is risk assessment and risk management, being able to trade off things like convenience and privacy or um, convenience and security, right? Uh, over the last couple of weeks, both Google and Facebook have come out to talk about how few of their users are actually using things like two-factor authentication. One of the reasons for that is because the convenience and account recovery process uh, just doesn't match up to the safety benefits from a consumer perspective. They're just not able um, to make those decisions. You also lose the ability to look at different points of view. And this is, a, this is particularly bad for people who are responsible for the safety and security of others, right? So if you think about um, not just security teams and companies, but also policymakers um, who are making these decisions um, that are going to impact a lot of people, if you're doing it from a, a place of fear, you're going to have a hard time looking at this from different angles. Um, and that's how we end up with security features or products that work really well for a certain group of people, but not for everybody. Oh. And in fact, as, as I mentioned, when you're uh, 
fear is also uh, habituated, which means that if you are exposed to it over and over again, uh, you actually become desensitized to it, which is also a problem if you're trying to help people understand security and if you want them to make better decisions. If you constantly berate them with a message of fear, um, over time they're just going to stop paying attention. Um, and so this is what I call the half-life of fear. It doesn't last very long in terms of actually being an effective motivator. When you lead with fear, you're going to create a whole lot of panic, but over time you get to this point of disregard where people stop paying attention and they don't care. Um, it's one of the things, particularly as a communications professional, that I think about all the time because the ways in which we communicate about these things to users really matter. If I'm just constantly sending you emails or if I'm constantly sending you alerts, you're going to stop paying attention to them. And so when, I re when something really is going wrong and I need you to take action, it, what if that's the email that you ignored because I sent you too many emails on other things, right? Uh, and so there's a lot of conversation and innovation happening in the industry right now about how can we better communicate about these things so that we're not, we're not pushing people into what we call warning fatigue. And so one of the things that, that I think about all the time is how can anyone who says that security is a priority simultaneously be communicating about it in a way that actually shuts down people's ability to retain the information, remember what they've learned, and make good decisions, right? And there's so much fear in the security industry, particularly in the way that we market or advertise, um, and certainly in the media coverage, right? Uh, and this is counterproductive to actually helping consumers um, learn about security. Uh, one of the things that I think is really important is raising the literacy um, of consumers um, so that they're not uh, solely dependent on other people doing this for them, right? We need them to be able to provide feedback and pushback um, when things don't make sense for them um, and need to empower them to be able to identify um, more risks on their own. And so people always come to me and they're like, but Melanie, fear gets people's attention. This is how I get my name in the headlines. This is how I get you know, quotes in news articles. Um, and they're right. Fear does actually get people's attention. Uh, so much so that Jaws, which was first aired in 1975, is still top of mind for people when they think about sharks. Uh, now you'll remember in my, in my previous life, um, working, working with sharks, one of the things that we were constantly um, coming to head with was the public fear and perception of these animals, which meant that it was really difficult to get really good laws and policies passed in order to protect these animals, uh, which has a very real impact on the entire ecosystem uh, within the ocean and has some economical um, impact as well, especially if you're in the fishing industry. Um, and so in 2001, um, Time Magazine actually declared it summer of the shark. Uh, and so despite the fact that there was not actually an increase in shark attacks that year, because somebody claimed that it was summer of the shark, every single shark attack became mainstream news that summer. And this perception of sharks is actually really, really difficult to fight because we've created this fear and we have this inherent um, and kind of prehistoric uh, response within our limbic system to fight or flight. And so people will not protect the things that they don't care about. And when people are really, really scared of something like a shark or a hacker, it's really difficult to get them to think clearly about what's happening and to help them make smart decisions. And as a result, this is actually um, a list of all of the species of sharks that are currently vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. So you can imagine the task that we were faced within the marine science community on how do we get protections passed um, and enforced to protect all of these animals that were so critical to um, regulating the, the supply chain um, of, uh, of our oceans. Right? So think of all, all of these animals and all of these different species that are at risk because the public is scared of them. 
And to be honest, most of these animals are smaller than you. They're not big apex predators. In fact, very few sharks actually fall into that category. So how do we actually neutralize fear, right? If, if we accept the fact that this is not the right way to communicate, um, and, if there, and if we're looking for other ways um, to help people understand the issues, what are those options? Could there be another part of the brain that we could stimulate instead that would have a different response than what we get from the limbic system? And it turns out there is. It's the midbrain. This is actually located between the brain stem and the limbic system. And so this is where we have our dopamine center. It's where we do a lot of our cognitive processing and cognitive function. So this part of the brain, when stimulated, actually increases those types of behaviors that we want to see. It increases your memory and increases your ability to process information and to focus. And, in, and those are, in fact, the optimal, um, the optimal response um, for good decision making. So how do we actually stimulate this part of the brain, right? If we know that fear stimulates the limbic system, what kind of stimuli do we need to have in order to um, trigger the midbrain? And it turns out curiosity does that. Getting people genuinely interested and curious and asking questions stimulates the midbrain. So the question then for those of us who work in security is, how can I get you as a, either a non-technical person or a consumer or my CEO, how do I get you so jazzed and excited um, and curious about security? Because that's how you'll learn. And it turns out there's another really good example for this, also from sharks. So there's a really great study that was done um, by researchers in New Zealand um, to try to mystify or demystify the, the public perception of sharks, uh, great white sharks in particular. And so over the course of two years, they um, worked with folks from 20 different countries. They did 150 um, cage dives uh, with tourists. So these are people who don't know anything about sharks. They're not primed or, you know, they're, they're not experts. Um, and a lot of them actually really do come um, from a place of fear until they have this experience. In fact, nothing corrects, the, corrects that kind of public perception um, more so than having an encounter with a shark under these safe conditions. Actually having a personal one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, with a shark actually leaves people not only unafraid, but generally passionate and curious um, about these animals. And so over the course of this study, um, this is a result, these are some quotes from the, uh, some of the tourists um, who actually participated in the study. And you can see how differently they felt about these animals. Now again, remember, these are great white sharks that they were cage diving with. Like these are literally the ones that are supposed to be like the mindless man-eating killers, right? And you have tourists coming out of this experience going, this was so amazing. There wasn't fear. It was actually very calm and peaceful. Um, and they're very just inquisitive and, and curious animals, right? So I look at this and I think about whether or not there's something similar to this that we could bring into the world of security. How can we give people that one-on-one that -on -one experience? One of the most important results um, of uh, the, the shark tourism business, um, as it's called, um, is that it's actually now impacted the bottom line of um, uh, government revenue and, and uh, bringing business into certain countries. And so it is now, as you can see uh, from some of these headlines, sharks are actually worth a lot more alive than dead. Um, and that was not so much a, if you like sharks, help us protect them. It was a, we've given people an opportunity to engage with them that they're willing to pay for. And now these governments and countries are motivated to protect them, right? We've removed the fear, and now they are a treasured part of the, um, 
uh, country's revenue um, and economy. It also helped us pass um, some really important um, conservation regulations because countries wanted these animals to continue to be around um, to help feed the tourism business. And so, again, thinking about um, is there a way that we can turn some of these security tourists into advocates? So some of the, uh, the security tourists that, that I run into most often in, uh, in my job are business leaders, from C-suite all the way down to uh, product managers, sales teams, the engineers. Like I said, it, you may be you know, an SRE engineer over here, and I'm trying to get you to patch something. Uh, we have to be able to work together. Marketing teams. Marketing is one of my greatest challenges, if I'm being honest. <laughs> They love hype, uh, and helping them understand uh, how to talk about these topics and these issues in a way that doesn't cause fear uh, actually helps us a lot in terms of scaling um, the neutrality um, of fear, right? To actually neutralize that um, at a mass scale. And then legal. Uh, if anyone has ever worked with attorneys, they are very, very risk averse. Um, but they're not security risk averse, they're legal risk averse. And so helping them understand security in a way so that they're willing to let us take more latitude on the communication side and on the product side so that we can offer better um, security and privacy to our users. And understand, when you're working with them, you need to understand what motivates them and what their blockers are. Because it turns out their blockers will become your blockers. Security kind of lives uh, at the hub of all of these groups. And if you don't help those outside spokes undo their blockers, you're not going to get very far in getting this um, integrated into the culture and the DNA of your company. And so the question then remains, how can I take these people and turn them from just people who visit security now and then as a tourist to people who will actually fight and advocate um, for these issues, not just within the company, but in the broader community and with um, the industry at large. So I like to call Bug Bounty cage diving for InfoSec. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar um, with how bug bounties work um, specifically, I gave a little bit of overview at the beginning, but what happens is when somebody sends us a report, the first thing our team does is triage and validate and make sure that it's reproducible, make sure that this, this bug or this vulnerability really does in fact exist. And then we need to figure out how to fix it. And that process is really, really important for these tourists to, co to come see and to shadow and to understand. People think of security incidents as like big data breaches that happen every once in a while. I deal with security incidents on a weekly basis because I have a bug bounty program. And so I am richly and intimately engaged in all of these reports coming through, which kind of becomes a crash course for me from a technical perspective. I know where our systems are weakest. I know um, which of our engineering teams need more education or better tooling uh, so that they're not producing uh, as much code uh, that have these vulnerabilities in them. And so I have found that bug bounty is a really, really great cage diving experience for those people who I need to come in and turn from tourist into advocate. And so a couple of things that you can do to help with this is give them access to the bug bounty reports, right? Like my attorneys can go and look at these reports um, if they have questions on, you know, was user data touched? Does this, you know, trigger a disclosure requirement for us? Um, having them in payout meetings is also really important because a lot of things that I have to communicate externally was the severity of certain bugs. Every researcher in the world thinks that their bug was the most important bug that was ever found, right? And so you have to be able to understand how the severity ranks um, and why. A lot of times uh, we'll get reports that will come in that appear to be very severe. Uh, and what folks may not realize is that on the back end and behind the scenes, there's, you know, we might have something like rate limiting or multi-factor authentication that would actually um, prevent exploitation um, of this issue. And then having folks in, in the triage session is really, really important. People tend to be afraid of security because they don't have the technical experience, and so they feel a little bit insecure and uncomfortable talking about the topic in general, 
And if you have them shadow these triage sessions, it really is a crash course in your technical environment. And it will make them more comfortable um, operating uh, in this environment. And so it helps them understand not just the risk severity and technical concepts, but it also helps them understand the remediation process, which is critically important if you're trying to move fast. Uh, for a really long time, there was this clash in the industry between security and speed, where if you moved really fast, you were creating a lot of security debt. And now we're kind of seeing that flip on its head with some of these uh, widespread ransomware um, and malware attacks where I actually need you to move as quickly as possible so I can patch this thing before it gets exploited. Uh, and so speed has now become a necessity uh, for security. And so helping people understand the remediation process helps it move a lot quicker. And so in closing, I just want to remind everyone um, about why we do this kind of work. Uh, and understanding it's not just about the technical pieces, but it's also about how we're making people feel. And if we're holding their hand through that process and that experience, I want my users to be better off because they interacted with my security team uh, and not just you know, feeling like we, we covered a hole somewhere, right? There's an opportunity for us every time we talk to our users about security or privacy, those touch points are important. It's not just about your Uber account or you know, some other specific account. It's helping you become more comfortable with the issue in general and doing it in a way that doesn't create fear because this is knowledge that you will take with you to every single online experience that you have, every single account, every single place where you've shared personal information. This is really, really important. Uh, and so for those of you who are interested in security, uh, I would encourage you to think about these intersection points um, of where can you take your knowledge of security and match it with something else um, and actually have um, really great impact um, for consumers in protecting um, their data. So thank you very much. I will take questions if you have them. Um, otherwise, I will be at the showcase place uh, afterwards if you want to meet up with me there.